Right, let's call this house to order. <coughs> Welcome to round six of the first China VP. Uh, to open this debate, let's invite the Prime Minister to propose the motion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, Mr. Speaker, sir, let me dive straight into today's motion. Now, what do we mean when we say that we are not allowing such citizens of such an age group to immigrate overseas? Now, basically, as the motion has already suggested, basically no permanent settlement overseas out of your home country as long as you're between the age of 20 and 29. In other words, this is a nuance that the opposition must come to terms with. It basically means that it's still possible for such citizens of such an age group to travel overseas as long as you're not settling overseas permanently. In other words, it's okay if you go overseas to travel on vacation or on working trips as long as you do not take up re uh, residency in that country. Now, what we argue on the side of the government today is that outside of the house, our policy today will, benefit, will better benefit a state and a country in two main ways. Firstly, on the economic front, and secondly, on my social front. And this is what I, in my substantive material, will show to you, and this is what my deputy will show to you as well. So, moving on to my constructive material for today. Now, I, the first, I as the Prime Minister, will be talking to you today, firstly, about the phenomenon of brain drain and why it's a bad thing. No, thank you, sir, on both the economic and social front. And my second speaker will be talking to you about how, on a, more, how on a more abstract level, how is the duty of every citizen to contribute back to society. So now, moving on to this phenomenon of brain, of brain drain. So basically, what does it mean? Basically, it's the phenomenon in which we see skilled labor, uh, no, not just skilled labor, unskilled, both skilled and unskilled labor moving from a developed, from a developing country to a developed country. Now, why is this problematic for states in general? Because we must come to terms with the reality that citizens are most productive during their 20 odd years of age for two main reasons. Firstly, because their skills are the most up to date. Because when you are 20 odd something, you have just graduated from university or any other form of educational institution, your skills are the most relevant and up to date within the economy, within the context of the economy. On the second level, more fundamentally, you are at your healthiest and therefore you are at the most productive and efficient period of your life. Now, Mr. Speaker, so why do we say that brain drain is a problematic uh, phenomenon, even taking into consideration that globalization has eroded barriers between different countries? Now, Mr. Speaker, so we tell you that this is an inefficient allocation of resources for one main reason. Because what you're doing when you allow brain drain to take place freely without any form of check and balance, as what we are suggesting so, on this side of the house, no thank you, sir, sit down, is problematic because you're exacerbating the lopsided global economy. Now, we confront an economy, a global economy today, where we see a stuck get in terms of economic performance between the developing world and the developed world. So what happens, let's say I am a skilled labor, skilled laborer in a developing country. What I'm going to think is that I want to move to a developed country because that's where I think where I'm going to have the most opportunities to, uh, to pursue happiness in general. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, we tell you today that labor is important to any country's economic development, not just to a developing country to or, to, or to a developed country. In fact, we tell you that labor is even more important to a developing country because without labor, Without the without when you especially when you lose such skilled labor which is in in the minority in these developing countries, we tell you, Mr. Speaker, sir, it's difficult for these countries to make a step up from so, low value industries to high value industries. No, thank you, sir. The reason is that you need skilled labor, people who know how to operate machinery, people who with the know-how to the to do the technical stuff, to and so that you can move away from manufacturing and to move towards a more service-oriented industry. Mr. Speaker, sir, we tell you that what we want in today's world is that we want to see a more equitable global economy. And Mr. Speaker, sir, sir, we believe we can achieve this. No, thank you, sir. By, and by, by making sure that those, those citizens between the age of 20 and 29, when you're at your most productive and most efficient age, you do not leave your country and move to another country, that you contribute back to the, to the economy by working in the country itself. And this is the main economic benefit that we see from our policy today. So now moving on to my second argument, now just before that, yes sir. Now wouldn't you agree with me that the human life is so complex that you shouldn't actually reduce it to this economic unit called labour, whose sole purpose in life is to sir, be subservient sir. to the state and become an economic unit of the state. So I, I completely agree with you, that's why the state has various other functions such as we build museums for our citizens, we, we have art theatres for our museums, because we do not consider them as just economic units. But let's face it, when you're doing the economic planning for the future of your country, especially if you're a developing country, you need to take into consideration this hard consideration. And this is something that I seem to be hearing from opposition they are not coming to terms with. That we need to deal with the hard fact that labour is the most important factor of production in ensuring that their country can make a step up next to, the, to be on par, or at least be competitive to the developed countries in general. 
Now moving on to my second argument about how exactly does our policy ensure the returns on the investment made by the government. Now if you take a look at how sir. exactly, no thank you sir, how exactly the government spends the taxpayers' money, is that we build up a structure, a superstructure of social support network. You see I'm talking about things like schools, hospitals, uh, and things like that, and housing, you know, as providing a safe environment for this group of individuals to grow up in. Now Mr. Speaker, so why 20 is that specifically? Because if you live before that, we are okay with that. Because you have not reached the age at, at a point where society has given all, given you all you have, and now it's up to you to pursue your own happiness. Yeah, yeah. Before you are 20, it's okay. Sir. No, thank you, no thank you, sir. But once we, what, what we tell you is that once you reach your 20 or something, that you have received the maximum that society can give to you. And therefore now, yeah, yeah. The, the state has a responsibility to ensure returns on the taxpayer's money that has been used to, to nurture you, to cultivate you. Mr. Speaker, sir, this is a, a duty that the government has to the taxpayers and not just to these group of individuals themselves. No, thank you, sir. Now, we talk, we, I, just, I just mentioned to you this duty that the government has to ensure that money, that public funds is being used properly. And Mr. Speaker, sir, sir. this is where our policy comes into play. No, thank you, madam. Our policy ensures that, that this, for these individuals for the products of this superstructure of social support network will eventually come back and stay in our country to contribute back to society, not just economically, but also, but, but also participating in the social fabric uh, building con uh, process. And this is why, Mr. Speaker, sir, we tell you that it's important for the government on the first level that we, they have a fundamental duty to taxpayers in the first place to ensure that returns are made on their investment using public money to cultivate this group of people. On the second level, that the citizens have an opportunity, to, uh, they have a duty back to the country to construct it in the nation building process, which is what my deputy will go on to talk to you more about later on. And Mr. Speaker, sir, what have I shown you today? I show you that on both fronts, both on the economic front, it's better for the country as a whole, and as well on the social front, that the government has a fundamental duty to its people to ensure that the taxpayers, that the tax money that you are paying to the government is being used in a proper way and that our returns don't run away to us just because they think that life is more lucrative out there. And this is why, Mr. Speaker, sir, we believe that we need to ensure that as long as you're between the age of 20 and 29, you do not immigrate. Because we believe that once, this, once these individuals are lost, they will not come back. And in this way, you irreversibly change the course of the nation of the nation and how this nation is going to develop. And for those, all these reasons, on both fronts, that, and that because I've shown you on both fronts, on the economic and social front, and I've basically fulfilled my criteria for today, that, we should, that I'm proud to propose. Thank you. We thank the previous speaker. We now invite the leader of the opposition. First, a bit of a question to the case that was set up by the opening government, and then going on to our case construction from the opposition. We felt that when they were arguing about for people between the age of 20 to 29, they were omitting a very important part of the group who's between 18 and 20. Like us, our side, we don't really want to get into that kind of issue. We just want to clarify, we believe this debate is about people who are under 30 cannot emigrate, not about whether 18 to 20 can or cannot, right? The second issue, they were talking about permanently settled, right? What exactly is permanently settled? Does it include permanent residence or is it only about changing your nationality or changing your citizenship and changing another passport? We think that that's something we should all include in this case. So as a case, we want to make it very clear that we stand to support like any kind of settlement that's outside, whether it's permanent residence or that's changing your nationality. We think both of them are fine. So just to lay out the groundwork, right? So in this discussion by Prime Minister, we think that not only did he neglect the value of human being, which is a fundamental value that we need to actually consider as a government when government wants to maximize the welfare and benefit and happiness of all its people and make sure that their individual personality and identity is respected rather than being coerced by the state. But secondly, even within the economic calculus that they are still making a wrong decision with this idea of the market. So let me move on to what like the deal with their argument first, right? So when they're talking about this economic calculus and they're talking about there's this brain drain that is happening, we say, yes, it's true that maybe brain drain is happening, but what is the reason why brain drain is happening? 
Is it because your country cannot offer enough and enough good jobs compared to elsewhere, right? So if that is the reason, why shouldn't your country improve, right? I'll talk to you later on about how you can improve. Point but down. eventually, right, if someone thinks that I can make much more money outside and I will be stuck in here, that I can't make as much money, will they work for your country wholeheartedly in a way that it is productive, in a way that truly benefits your country, right? But let's consider the second layer of this issue. Even if they can stay inside of their country, can they perform? It's not really about their attitude. It's about in developing countries, and many of these underdeveloped countries, there even lacks the facility, lacks the infrastructure to make these skilled labor and skilled engineer and scientists to make use of what they have studied. If you are a nuclear scientist, you are a rocket scientist, you want to do something meaningful for your country, yet your country is still struggling to tap into any kind of research in this kind of advanced technology, you can't do it. You have to go outside. Otherwise, your value is diminished inside of your country, being kept just working on some very small, very unproductive projects that wasn't really helping your country. In effect, actually, after you doing research in U.S., maybe you can come back and contribute to your own country, even if you have changed your citizenship, even if you have permanent residence, which I will talk later. Right? But eventually, right? There's also issues. For example, when they talk about upgrading the developing countries' industry and saying that is the way to go, we totally agree, right? That upgrading is the way to go. But in the first place, as I mentioned in the for, uh, beforehand, when your country is such in such a poor and such an under developed state, you might be stucking these people inside, not really upgrading it. And secondly, even if you want to upgrade, you want this upgrade to happen organically. Take a, look, take a look at the way China developed in the 30 year of opening up and reform. We started off from manufacturing, right? So that was very low level job. But yet, when there is only low level job, people see that there is chances. There are companies like Huawei, right? These high tech companies, solar panel producers, they know that there might be a chance in future. They can invest in them. They can try to seize the market opportunity. Instead of you stucking these people inside your country, forcing them to do whatever is good for your country, yet that might not be really the best possible way both for these individuals to develop and for their country to develop, right? So that's basically about their point. Let us talk about what exactly are the people who want to emigrate and then go back to my point about the value of human being and the value of the economic confidence of people and the Very country again. So. Sorry. Like when we're talking about people who want to emigrate, right? We're eventually talking about two groups of people. One group of people who are absolutely sure what they want to do. They have made clear comparison between different countries. They understand that their research cannot be done in their own country. They understand that their religion is being oppressed in your own country and they want to go to another country. We say that for these kind of people, when they want to seek a clearly better choice in an informed way outside, that must be a better way for them to, uh, to do so. If you're a homosexual stuck in a Muslim country, right, you don't really want that to happen and you want to move to a more like liberal country, and yes, we must actually make that happen. Otherwise, that person would be scrutinized and would be coerced in that country alone. Wouldn't you agree, sir? Uh, I tell you that oppressed minorities are out today because they can seek political asylum yeah, yeah. 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 in the first place. But there are not only people who are seeking political asylum that is at stake in here, right? We're talking about so many different groups of people. It's about the community they choose. It's about the kind of welfare system they choose. It's the kind of country that they eventually feel that they're in accordance with. But more than that, right? There are also many other people who made their comparison based on not only the religious identity and stuff, and such, right? They, for example, they felt that us becoming an artist and who is very international, they want to make working easier by having a passport from another country simply to travel easier, to sign contract easier, to avoid all sorts of regulation by their home country, for example. That's exactly the case in China. That's not only for artists, that could also be businessmen, that could also be so many different groups of people who are categorized in this case. What is nationality, ladies and gentlemen? They change it, or permanent residence. They change it, not simply because they love another country more. It could be because they love another country more, or it could be simply for a practical benefit. Now, you don't allow these businessmen to do better business simply because they're stuck in your own country. You can't actually get that 
better for your own country. But let's talk about the second group of people, right? Just as I was talking about people who are informed and who can weigh the issue. What about people who are not really that much informed, who doesn't really understand that going abroad might give them trouble, there might be cultural shock and stuff, right? We say eventually there's still fallback mechanism. If they feel that outside is not that good, if they feel that actually all these personal satisfaction that they thought that they could achieve will not be achieved outside, they can still come back to the country. Eventually we're discussing a display talking about short term and long term. Yes, you might sacrifice human resource in short term, you might have a lot of problem in short term, but we do see a lot of people going abroad and send money back to their home country to develop, to bring technology back to their home country to develop. We say out of necessary like situation, they have to do so. We'd rather protect the right of the human being. Thank you very much. Okay, we thank the previous speaker. We now invite the Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. 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 Good morning, Speaker Sir. Today we come up and we see a leader of opposition who knows, we feel, we know nothing about nation building. How so? <laughs> essentially what happens is that he told us essentially a country needs to develop, to hold back its talent, to hold back people who are under 30s as they have mentioned, but then they have never tackled the, the whole idea of why is it below 30s. Because in, in the, whole, the whole premise of the motion today is during 20s and in which my PM has already told you that this is essentially because this is where they are most economically viable and they have already gotten everything that the country can give to them and therefore they they should have the duty to contribute to the country economically, and which I will cover my sub substantive later. So, now why do I say that the leader of opposition have no idea what this nation building about? Because essentially what he has told us just now essentially is that the country, like developing countries, have a lack of infrastructure. And therefore, people will, you know, will go out to, to research, will go out to study. But our PM has already told you essentially that we are not limiting the fact that you go overseas to study. We are not limiting your, your travel visas to go overseas to do research. Essentially what we are, what we are limiting you from doing is, a, is to go overseas and settle down there yeah, yeah. permanently. Yeah, yeah. So essentially what is at stake we are trying to tell you is that the loyalty of the the loyalty to the country by the citizen and the duty of the citizen to contribute back to the society. So therefore, what I'm going to tell you now in my substantive essentially is the whole idea of nation building. Okay, we have a government, sir. Okay, no thank you, sir. Essentially, the, if we look at the country in a sense, uh, from a very macro point of view, we have the government and the citizens itself. The government has been chosen by the people to, to vote in, to the, uh, uh, and they have a duty of care to take care of the people, essentially, to lead the people to a better, sustainable future. And therefore, what we're trying to tell you that, essentially, is that the government has already provided enough opportunities, infrastructure, education systems, etc., to give to such, to give to all citizens for them to develop themselves, to be active and uh, so, engaging parts so. of the society and therefore what we are going to tell you is that the citizens likewise no thank you sit down essentially we have also a duty to contribute back to our society why so let me move to you let me let me re illustrate my PS point essentially we are telling you that we have invested so much into a group of youths a group of future leaders of the of our country and then we want them to stay back for these 10 years to make that decision we want them to stay back at this 10 years to contribute Sorry. back to the, con to the economy hold on and okay. we want we want them to contribute back to the economy and therefore help in nation building help in building infrastructure that opposition say the country led and therefore they are leaving okay yes sir what kind of nation building are you talking about? When people in their 20s and 30s are being forced to stay against their will, when their political yeah, ideologies yeah. differ, and at the age of 30, they get out of the Okay, I get a point, anyway. Sir. Okay, I get a point, exactly. sir. Essentially, what we've already told you now, as the proposition bench, is that we do not stop the fact that you're going overseas to study or to work. Okay, and on your point on political refuge, you have a different political ideology, you have a different uh, sexual orientation that you feel that you know is against 
uh, the whole country's direction. Therefore, we've already highlighted to you that there are political asylums available. So therefore, what are you trying to, to, to value add to such a system in a sense? So, okay, let me move on back to my, my substantive. Essentially, what are the benefits we have when citizens contribute back to their, to their nation? Essentially, like uh, to illustrate what my, my PM had said earlier, essentially, there's an eco uh, economic point of view where we help to build the economic, uh, uh, essentially, we allow citizens to contribute back to the economy, and therefore, it, it, in itself, we have a productive labor force that is driving the economy forward, driving the country's futures forward. And okay, moving on to the next level, which sir. is the social level. No, thank you, sir. Essentially, we, we are talking about a sense of nation, uh, a sense of uh, taking ownership of your country and your country's future. Why so? Because in, in the globalized world, in our globalized world today, we understand, we understand that the fact that you know people are seeking opportunities overseas, and we, we, my PM has already illustrated to you that the fact that you know there's already a pre-existing uh, bad allocation of resources in which where no labor will just keep going over to countries where more, uh, more resources, more opportunities. But what about those that are developing? What we are trying to tell you now is that we want them to stay back and help to build the infrastructure, build such things to. So that essentially, in the end, we can compete comparatively, okay? And therefore, when we have a group of youth, group of people who are in their twenties to contribute, essentially back to the to the to the country's building, sit down. Essentially, what we're trying to tell you that is, we want them to take ownership of their country, take ownership of the future, and therefore, we will let more people, more youth, more people of this age group understand their country and and. And through that, we see, we may see a new, uh, new age of government leaders, political leaders, economic leaders, business leaders that arise from such group of people to take over the country or to take essentially take care of the country in the sir. future. Yes, sir. You hope that these people will understand you. But please respond to our analysis about what exactly are the motive for these people to seek to emigrate. They have their reason. They won't be kept when they are forced inside a cage. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, I don't understand what you're trying to say. Essentially, you're telling me that they will not want to stay in their country because they are trapped in a cage. But you have not told me the reasons why they feel that way. We have already illustrated to you that if you feel that your political views are against that of your country, if, you're trying, if, if your sexual orientation is against that of your country, we have other alternatives that is already in the society, in the current global context. Political asylum, we've told you a lot of times, and you have failed to acknowledge that. And therefore, so what we're trying to tell you today is that by, by contributing back to the country as a citizen, essentially, you're fulfilling two things. It, essentially, you're fulfilling two things. In one sense, you improve the government. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you improve the country. You take ownership as a citizen of your country's future, as a country's economy, as a country's social uh, build up in the future. You are the future leaders of the country. And therefore, with that, I'm proud to propose. Great, we thank the previous and I'll invite the deputy leader of the office. We're so sad for the government side who treats the citizens instead of state, not citizens but the properties of this country. We seem oh. extremely sad to that without the, the government, without respecting to the individual's identity choices, without respecting their own rational calculation towards that. We seem really, really pitiful. What they focus is about the economic benefits, economic, uh, social benefits. However, they never tell us why living, changing your nationality will definitely result in the economic the losses in this case. Well, we already, t we have to tell you Firstly, there are many citizens living in your country just to heavily burden your welfare system by not earning enough uh, on skills and letting your pay governments pay a lot. Well, secondly, we say that there's still a group of people, even though they choose to 
change your nationality just for practical reasons. What would make their life easier, or work easier, to travel easier in terms of uh, among different countries? We say, why not? Why not this group of people have no chances, have no intention to come back? We say, even if this group of people have no intention to come back, we say that is also have some kind of for some reasons lie into the government because you don't provide them the opportunities they want. You don't provide them the, the platform that can really demonstrate their full abilities towards that. What we need for a real economic stronger country is that we are led the organic change for leaving the job to the government themselves, Amen. leaving Amen. this, letting the government change the atmosphere and letting the individuals to, to solving the problems. Secondly, they mentioned about the brain gen issue. We think, yes, there might be a problem here, but why necessarily, by forcing them to living in this scenario will definitely solve the problem. Why you cannot encourage those people to stay here? Why you cannot use other means instead of limiting their choices, instead, instead of uh, uh, um, letting them love you better? S certainly, they're talking about the sense of ownership. Imagine that, why there is a sense of ownership? I feel a sense of belonging. I feel I'm being respected. I think I have the autonomy. I have the ability to change. If I were stuck and forced into a position, how come I make a change? How come I feel I was respected? Even if this per person were elected in the position, being elected as a leader, we don't know how much he really wants to contribute because we don't feel like a sense of belonging. So we think that those are issues that need to be tackled by the proposition side. And simply feel so bad about, so sad to, towards them. Then to, moving on to my substantiates. Why we say, well, today's issue is about individual identity versus national identity. We think the true meaning of citizenship is not only about duty, what you should do for your country, but country also should respect your own choices. You are the a government, you are not, a, you shouldn't choose those citizens as your properties towards that. Secondly, I don't, I'm going to be talking about the false impact. Uh, what will okay, be achieved towards that? Okay. Ma'am, when an individual commits a mistake or hurts or intends to hurt a society, is it okay for us as a government to respond accordingly? Yeah. Well, yeah, we agree that if this individual hurts the society, we definitely need to respond. But the problem is that why my welfare, my well-being, my living away, my choosing of another nationality will definitely result in the hurt of the society, will definitely result in the loss of, uh, in the loss of the economy. That is the thing that needs to be proved by the proposition side. I mean, well, I already mean. true to you, those artists, those um, scientists, they might feel more easier to living, to uh, having an, uh, another citizenship. Why not making their life easier? No. But talking about citizenship, we think that, well, citizenship is a, some kind of arbitrary choice. When you are born in this country, you are forced to receive those values, those ideologies composed by, uh, by the society. But it does not necessarily mean that you should receive and stuck in this position forever because we respect you as a moral agent, as a rational agent that are capable of making rash uh, the rational judgment, calculating calculate choices. So yeah. in this way we say, oh, no. actually it's just a kind of contract you signed with your government. Your government take care of you when you are young, but it does not, necess it does not necessarily mean that you should contribute by stucking in your age of 20s to 30s. We don't think that thing happens. Uh, uh, well, definitely we shall- Contradiction. <laughs> Go. Ma'am, you, you are proposing that we should not allow people under the age of 30 to go. Yet at the same time, you are saying that people going, leaving the country is good. So essentially, what do you want? Do you want them to go or not to go? Sir, this is another huge assumption from the opposite, proposition side. They assume once the people take another rationality, they will never have the abil ability, never have the willingness to come back and continue Boy, again. Man. It is because you are living in the other Shame. country, when you are starting a, a running a very big business, you have accumulated enough capital. It's right time for you to come back and have it oh, in your country, even if in a different nationality. We yeah. think this is more important by forcing you stuck in the position where cannot Hello. make your own career as a business leader. We think that is really benefit that is really problematic, both for the society and for the individuals themselves. We think the better situation is that let 
talents fully develop, their, their, uh, their potentials fully de develop, their capabilities. Well, at the same time, your governments also need to improve, also need to enhance your own job. For example, you have to create an atmosphere, create a sense of belonging, create the willingness of being loyal to you. Yeah. For example, in China, even though many Chinese people m m immigrate to other countries, they still have the intention to come back and invest more. We see a lot of cases towards that. Even in, nowadays, most of the foreign direct uh, investments are directed by the foreign Chinese, uh, foreign Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese people. So we see those things don't happen in this way. Well, secondly, we say this sense of belonging are generated by your respect or, or your or, or, or your capability. At the same time, the government itself needs to work hard to need working for the organic transformation, organic change to that, creating a more atmosphere that can let them fully demonstrate their ability, fully demonstrate their potentials to that. Well, their cases are extremely problematic. People people become really people hate to be stuck in the position. Secondly, they cannot develop their potential to the fullest, they cannot, which means that they cannot put into, uh, cannot pr contribute to the society to the fullest. We think it's a better way to let them to go, uh, to go and have a choice and come back and letting the government, to push the government to have a more organic, uh, 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 to, uh, better um, economic atmosphere, better develop, creating enough platforms for them. For those reasons, we are proud to oppose. Right, we thank the previous speaker, and I invite a member of the government side. Mr. Speaker, even though we tried to clarify over and over again, I still really don't get what the oppos opposition party actually wants, right? So let us refresh your memory what did Zheng Bo tell you. He told you that they do not stand for us claiming to have 20 to 29, right? He told you that as long as you are under the age of 30, we won't allow you to go out. But secondly, the deputy, uh, deputy leader of opposition told you that people needs to be fully, uh, people's ability needs to be fully demonstrated. We should let them go. And more importantly, they tell you that people hate to be stuck. So essentially, what are they proposing? What is their stance? We don't understand. And secondly, they tell you that uh, in certain cases, I don't have my, also uh, I'm a talent, right? I'm a young talent. I don't have a job. Uh, to my specialty, and therefore I want to go out. But ladies and gentlemen, I think we have several responses to you. Firstly, the chances of occurring in such situation is low. Why is that so? Because education system in the country itself is designed and tailored just for the country alone. Yeah, yeah. No thank you. No thank you. Take for the case of the like, Singapore, right? We don't have 500 or 10,000 doctors running around town. We don't have 500 or 10,000 lawyers running around town. Because that's not the market requirement. More importantly, the specialty that you are focusing on or what? environmental sciences because Singapore is short of water. So education system in itself is tailored to suit what the society needs. It's not tailored to benefit every single individual here. We are not as liberal or not as heavenly as what they portray us to be. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, even if they say that the needs of the, um, even if they say that, oh, um, they have abundance of talents running around. But we want to say that every single country in this world today are facing the same problem. We are running out of food, we are running out of water, we are running out of space. We need all this to help. Yes, we agree that lesser developed countries, they have um, lesser available spaces. But looking at the, uh, the flip side, we see that lesser developed spaces are also more spaces for de development. Yeah. More spaces that require yeah. more energies and more expertise. Yeah. So in this sense, ladies and gentlemen, these people going off to the country is not the way to go. And more importantly, we think we can recommend certain enhancement into this desperate situation. For example, to provide enhancement training, or even the, even uh, or even like what Singapore does, right? Or we combine the this kind of special talents and send them overseas to work on overseas project and earn the money back to Singapore. So their skills can be uh, can be used. Like for example, in the case of the eco uh, eco city in Tianjin, right? We have people who build uh, uh, infrastructures. We have people who build water, and these are not the essential so, skills. No, thank you. Not the essential skills that Singapore is. Uh, needing, uh, required for. However, we can organize these talents to send them overseas and work for us in Singapore. And they are not only contributing to places overseas, they are also contributing directly, no thank you, back to Singapore in itself. So we don't see what's the problem with, uh, uh, what's the problem with holding back in our country because we can provide the space for them. Now, moving on. 
there's still uh, several issues that we wish to tackle. Like, for example, the whole opposition here is trying to tell us that, oh, we should be very heavenly. We should pin our hopes on all these talents, assuming that they let them go. Pin our hopes on the talents. One day, they feel right for us to come back. No. The question is, no thank you. The question is, why are they, or why is the Huawei people, no thank you, Chen coming back to China? They say, because I recognize motherland. I recognize that China is the thing, place that I want to stay. But the essential thing is because China is the place for them to develop. No thank you a place for them to invest, a place for them to earn money. All we can say is, no thank you, China is very, uh, is very lucky to be in such a situation here. But in most countries and most underdeveloped countries, that is not the case. Yeah. Looking at Vietnam, looking at Cambodia, looking at Laos, look at Myanmar for, for heaven's sake. If these countries are not able or not enticing like China, the big fat uh, fish, will the people come back? And what if the people don't come back? The whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole case assumed by the opposition is they will definitely come back. But over and over again, they fail to show us how is it that we can create a national atmosphere for a fishing village yeah, and tell them that a fishing village is definitely your best choice. Now, moving on, ladies and gentlemen, what we want to argue today as closing, of a, uh, closing government here, two sides. Firstly, on the, t on, the, on the topic of brain drain, right? I think the opening government has already explained to you why brain drain is an important issue. We need to tell you, or we want to evaluate you, know, thank you. What are the other alternatives other than pulling these people back? What is the other choices for us to not brain drain? So we can look at situations like, say, Hong Kong, look at situations in Singapore. What are they trying to do? They try by collecting or by recruiting foreign talents into the society itself to help replenish or replace the talent that they already use. And ladies and gentlemen, let's face it, foreign talent is not the policy to go. Why is that so? Now looking at Hong Kong, they have a huge issue with Mr. Mr. Speaker, your country, the Filipinos, right? In Singapore, they also have a huge issue with your country, Mr. Speaker, the Filipinos. Why is that so? Because Filipinos, uh, I have to say it frankly, have different ways of lifestyle, different concepts of belief. They are bringing different values, different perspectives into our society here. And more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, the people that is competing with your fellow countrymen, no thank you, are the people who are less vulnerable, less competent, and less able. Why? Because the competent and the able people have already left the country, for God's sake, to the United States of America, to better so, places than you have. No thank you. So in this sense, how do you expect them to compete with the fellow, uh, fellow Filipinos? And more importantly, if they cannot compete for the fellow, Filipi uh, fellow Filipinos, where does the government stand? What would the countrymen think of this government? Are you favouring the foreign talents in advice for us? Uh, in, uh, in, in favour for us and make things good for us, ladies and gentlemen? Even though we see that there's economic, I think in a second, even though we see there's economic benefits for Singapore over and over again, but we also see that in general elections, and also see all tons and numerous websites that people hate it. So essentially, what is the better choice of government? Yes, go. Maybe it's true that the receiving countries shouldn't receive so many foreign workers, but how is that relevant to a debate in which we're discussing about whether the countries should send, should allow yes, people to enter? Yes, <laughs> So, you see, it totally, it totally relates to us. Why? Because right now, we are talking about a case where we lose our talents and they never come back. And the thing is, even if they come back, while the time, uh, in the meantime, they are gone, right? we need people to work in that place. We need people to fill up the spot. Yeah. We need people to help expand us. Then the thing is, where do we look for these people? Do we look for people in our secondary school or primary school or even kindergarten? Clearly not, because they're not ready. So we look at people who are fresh off the market from Filipino, uh, from Philippines, from Malaysia, from nearby countries. And that is the issue. When creating social, uh, social tension in itself, you are weighing the cost and the benefit here. What is the heavier cost? Clearly the social tension, because it's harder to, when once they come into our nation, it's hard for them to leave. We can't tell them, oh, you have done your, uh, done your job. Thank you very much. Go back to your hometown. It's, it's, it's a terrible situation that we have to face. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, globalization here. We agree that globalization helps with all uh, benefits and uh, all efficiency in the situation here. But the, the true thing is, who does the globalization help? Globalization helps people who are, like I mentioned, competent and able. But that was the real situation here. That this society is not made up of all competent and all able people. There's people who are less competent and able. And what do we do about them? The situation right now we are facing is that we can do nothing about them because we can't help them as a whole. And when we come down, that is bad. But it gets worse because there's other people from other nations that are enjoying the benefits and the fruits of our labor and our economy. And this is making the social tension worse. So in all these things we see, by choosing the alternatives, by letting them to go with such a policy, we stand proud to propose our motion that we will not let them go. Thank you. Yeah. Right, we thank the previous and I invite member of the office.
trust a Singaporean to transplant a Singaporean problem into a debate where, where there's no relevance to the debate whatsoever, where they have nothing better to say. Uh, speaker, sir, I think today's debate has been essentially a very messy one in which the very key principles have not been elucidated. And before we move into our, our closing extension or the alternative mode of our alternative models of growth, the harms of status quo, and why green dream is actually an okay thing for uh, why green dream is actually okay for the state to accept. I think we need to clarify a lot of what transpired in today's debate. Firstly, coming from uh, coming from opening government, I had a feeling that they were talking about developing countries, and coming from closing government, I thought they would do the same thing as well until they talk about. Uh, that Singaporean problem whereby we hate all the foreign talents who come, or foreign immigrants who come in. So, foreign immigrants usually come into a more developed country. So, I'm not exactly sure whether they're talking about a developing or developed country. Which is it? Back, and that is why, sit down, man. Then that is why we think that it's fundamentally crucial for us to elucidate some of the more, some of the more salient Point principles on. involved. So, what transpired in today's debate was this. Opening government reduces people to units of production. They think that because you are aged 20 to 29, therefore you have this kind of a, you have you are most economically viable, you are most healthy, you can be the most productive. And because you can, therefore we shall coerce you to stay here and work against your will. What it doesn't what it doesn't take into account is that even if you want to draw an analogy to a corporate culture whereby the state is our management, managing its employees, when you don't take into account the kind of calculus, the kind of individual calculus of the of, of people to decide for themselves what is happiness to them, then what necessarily results is that all these super social structural network that they were talking about then becomes a very tokenistic approach to keep to sustain them rather than to, as a form of entertainment much like how the management culture adopts tokenistic approaches like water water coolers casual fridays and work-life balance second we think on our side we see maximizing happiness is an individual is an individual right the calculus involved goes beyond the utilitarian calculus of Oh, I, uh, for the past 20 years, I've been indebted to my motherland for providing me with such wonderful opportunities and now it is my duty, it's my solemn duty to give back to society. To society. They say no. If you look at the, if you look more closely, maybe the opening, uh, maybe the opening opposition didn't do a very good job. Uh, of, so let's talk about what happiness actually means. Ha maximizing happiness within the context of social, con of, of within the context of social contract theory involves Trading, giving up rights, right, uh, giving up some some rights yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 in order in return for some in order in return for some other rights. So what are the rights that the kind of rights that's given up differs between states. Some some countries like Singapore, some backward countries like Singapore, will obviously take off things like freedom of political for political speech and yeah. probably political thought, so and so forth. But these are the things apart. These are the things that are important to them. In Singapore, political ideology. For is might be important to an individual. In Malaysia, racial and religious identity might be important to, in, to an individual. In certain other in certain other countries, even the Philippines, when they talk about political, about political ideology, sit down, sirs. When you talk about political ideologies, the RH the RH bill might be the last straw that breaks the camel's one camel's back for you to decide whether or not you want to emigrate. But right now, under their paradigm, they disregard your calculus, they disregard your political ideology, your religious identity, your sexual identity, your sexual identity, and your ideas about how society should work. And reduce everything to an economic calculation and put you uh, and put you against your will working uh, and working in a uh, uh, work, working for them and somehow this contributes to nationhood but at the end of the day what we really have to ask ourselves is this what con in this debate what contributes better to nationhood coerce restriction of, on immigration policies or allowing individuals to maximize their policy. And this is where we this is where we come in. We say that citizens do not have the kind of duty uh, duty to repay or repay the state based on the idea that people raise an idea that somehow because the state provided for you. Therefore you must return it uh, return it back to them. It is a very cultural construct. Where in Western liberal democracies, uh, Western liberal democracies, even when you talk about the parent-child relationship, the child is a dependent for 18 years. But after which 
uh, after which he's considered an independent individual and there's no need for him to actually repay the payback to her parents. It's a very cultural construct in Chinese conservative societies before that changing. So, so essentially what you're saying is that we should just pin our hopes that one day our culture is strong enough to pull them back. No. Look, answer me, what if the culture no. is not Sit strong now, enough? Sir. What, what we're saying is that, yeah, well, all the opposition say that we pin our hopes that one day they may come back because they felt that culture, that, um, after many years, they are not stagnant in their ideology, in, in their mind. They are not like they are not debaters like you. Still, so they <laughs> think they think that cultural identity is ultimately important. That they feel a sense of emotional attachment to uh, to their to their great motherland, and then to go where they come where they come back and contribute. That is up to the individual to decide. What we want to say is that we think that fundamentally. We, we don't see the economy as a kind of a stagnant, more, as a stagnant model. Our extension is this. Alternative models of having of importing immigrants is a viable policy for a state, you know, for a state to, take, uh, to take on. Why? When immigrants come, here, come to our country because they agree, they, they agree with our ideology, they agree with the kind of, uh, they agree with the fundamental kind of ideas that, uh, that we have. And that's why they're willing to contribute to our oh, nation, sir. our oh, state, oh. our order, our state, our nation, and contribute and also maximize our uh, maximize own happiness in the, in, in the process. And secondly, we see the brain drain as, a essentially, as an essential risk that the, the state must take. Because the brain drain serves as a mechanism for, people, for, the, for the state to improve its own governing system. If a lot of people are getting out of the country, it is, it is, it is symptomatic of a problem that's brewing within the country. You can't put a lid on a problem that's already brewing. The way forward is to go with our, with our paradigm and look at how to improve the system. Listen to the people, obey the social contract theory, and look and amend it such that people would be incentivized to stay within the country and, contrib and contribute. What you have when you don't do this is the idea of naked entrepreneurs or in China, whereby people have moved all their assets, relocated all their families to an overseas location, and they can they can relocate at the drop of a hat. If you want to answer the question of nation building, then go with our side that says that says allow them the freedom, allow them this freedom to maximize their own happiness, because that is the way to go. Great, we thank the previous and invite the government. argument I feel extremely confused. First of all, when they talk about brain drain, it's a signal for government to improve its infrastructure or whatever it is. Two questions. Who are those people who actually immigrate into foreign countries? And who are the ones who stay behind? First of all, when you see people actually immigrate out of the country, they are capable, they are, uh, they are more talented and skilled in the, in the certain perspective. For example, they are more like hand, uh, they are more aware they're more exposed to advanced technology, they're more equipped with the modern uh, knowledge that could assign them. So that's the person, that are the people who work out mostly in the status quo. Yeah. And who are those left behind? Are usually those who don't really have that social ladder for them to climb in the, uh, th that good social ladder for them to climb in the first place, and they are left behind, and they are not as competitive as a construction force as those who go away. So how could possibly government improve its infrastructure, improve its basic facilities, for its people to further develop in the future, yeah, yeah. first place. So actually, I don't really see, sit down, <laughs> what kind of role they are portraying. Is it God is going to give them something ultimately, <laughs> ultimately out of sudden? And secondly, he may contradict himself, right? When did he ta actually talk about the a concept of social contract, when you actually talk about how you give some part of right to a government, and then you enjoy some part of freedom that exchange. Right. Sit down, right. sit down. When we say that, actually that part of the equation in the status quo is not e equal at all. We see that government has invested vast resources on you, like coach uh, education, you can sit down, sit, um, primary school, middle school, whatever it is, and that makes you who you are as the identity of this people from this nation in the first place. It's not simply about the education you receive, as Chen Lin talked to you about. It's more like the culture, cultural perspective that has added to you and that's molded you to who you are in the first place. So this is the high time for you to step into you, a step on your country to do something sit down constructive in the first place. My Two own. questions in this debate. First of all, sit down, not after the first clash. Why, is government has to, why does the government have the right to keep them? And secondly, why 
why is it actually a good way and why is it actually an effective way for us to do so. And first of all, we see a vicious circle in the status quo. As we told you, as Chen Lin told you in, the, in his analysis and his rebuttal, that edu our education system, our current, uh, current social, uh, social structure is tailored to the need that the society actually needs. We, uh, we, uh, for example, we set up law majors for a student like Chen Lin or whatsoever because we know that how much amount of lawyers we are going to need in the future. So that is exactly government arrangement for sit down in the first place to, to, general, uh, to make, make sure this society works in a way. However, in the opposition's proposal, by allowing them absolute freedom of mobility in the first place, to allow them to go out to seek for their talent development or for their uh, further potentials, we see that this huge gap is generated. So that is why Chen Lin introduced a second layer of analysis, how a country gets talents, right? How a yeah. sit down, how actually a country works in a way that sustains itself. So but when the gap is actually uh, occurring, for example, for example, when we hold, uh, for, uh, when the gap is occurring, we recruit people from overseas to go to fill into fill into this gap, which originally sit down the uh, uh, original citizens from my country to fill in this job. Okay. So that is why we see a tension generated between these two groups of people, and that is why we see a failure in government managerial level that allowing the absolute free mobility for every individual, especially at their twenties and first place. Sit down. And secondly, why we say this why we say in the status quo, as I analyzed to you before, and who are those ones to immigrate and why they are so crucial to this society, right? So for them, they are the advancing power in this society and to take the country into the next level. We are not talking about we are uh, we are, we don't want Myanmar to fill uh, fill the fill this country with Foxconn and that uh, uh, they are that Sit down, that are not as high graded industry we have in the status quo. We want these countries to be some to maintain those talents who are at their most productive uh, age to feel something and to give the potential to create something Man. like sit down, the uh, examples of Apple to bring about innovation, to bring about the actual progress in the uh, actual progress and uh, uh, structural advance in this in the status quo. So that is why we keep them here and make them uh, and let them to work hey, in this status down cap uh, capacity in the status quo to fill in this gap. And secondly, when we talk about this rap, this move of moving away right, from developing countries to developed countries, we see what this move is actually radical. What they see from the target country that they want to immigrate to is simply a good fluffy face. See, they have advanced technology. Yeah. Sit down. See, they have the something that I want. They are not actually that. Uh, they are not actually see how they are going to suit into that society if they go into that specific area. However, in the status quo, by staying in their home country for uh, for past twenty or thirty years of establishing their own identity and their own position in this society, they are a better chances, a better starting point for them to go to next level. Uh, as I illustrated, Madam, lower house. Now, answer this assumption. Why is it that when I, who do not feel a sense of belonging to my country, will suddenly feel, will suddenly be very economically productive and want to contribute yeah. towards the nation building of my country? So, that question, first of all, I think it should be answered by your side of the house. We don't really think that sense of belonging necessarily linked to the productiveness of economy. Yeah. And even if we say the sense of, of belonging will definitely escalate the productivity, we see that is actually not something could be developed by one time sit down and for a past for uh, for a past for, for those uh, fresh blood to come into this mechanism of work of social construction they are not they are they are, they are like not fully on the way uh, not not uh, their identity is not fully established as a whole however by entering into a workplace by entering into a job field and they know better where they where, can, where they can aiming at and they see greater potential in the target group they enter in. So that is the thing we say in the status quo. And secondly, coming up nicely to my second point, what, what kind of society we want to create? Why is it actually good? We see from us, we see the ultimate goal of this uh, this thing is that we want to create uh, we want to uh, we want as much people to stay in our country as possible. We see that people just graduated from their university. They are not at that stable stages of establishing their national identity at that point. At that point, uh, during the past education whether they are overwhelmed by the nationalism education or they are overwhelmed by the westernized liberal democracy or what kind of fancy thing American dream that has provided to them. However, by letting them stay in this specific country, uh, uh, letting them stay here and make them work for at least 10, year of, uh, 10 years of span, finding their, where their position is really is and 
and make them be the owners of this country and take lead into the, of this country and make a structural progress. So that is ultimately what we want in the status quo. So that is why Chen Lim told you the country has arranged, arranged things, but we need cooperation from those, uh, from those young people, from the fresh blood, to finish this goal with us. We are very proud to propose. Right, we thank the previous to close this debate. Opposition to it. Anyway, yeah, so yeah. we have we have no, no I, I haven't heard any link 
why when you're forcing them to stay, they still will make contributions to our society. Or even as potential as they use, they should be. We say if they feel unhappy, they will just waste their talent. We don't think it's kind of good of allocation of talent. Oh, no. Okay. Then I think I mentioned in my uh, argument, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. Yeah. When you say that we keep them to stay and we will improve the condition, we even go to the extent that we will form a company so that we can bring them over to the world. We have projects, so many right? reasons not forcing them to stay. First, it violates yeah, yeah. people's rights to movement. Second, we have so many other uh, solutions. And Hello. third, they won't be as productive as they, they should be. We think it's a kind of waste of talent, not this time. Okay, the first uh, clash is brain drain issues. And the upper house just say they should be, you know, economic unit, and then they only assume all the, all the migrants will be uh, who wants to immigrate out of the country will be well high, like high talented. So to that group of people, we say all over your solutions, and also we want them to stay by their own will instead of forcing them to stay. And they also mention something about educational system. It's designed by the, you know, the need of the country, and they, the talents won't be wasted if you keep them in the country. Well, that is not true in the status quo because. The educational system is also by, driven by the profits and also driven by the market. Let me you tell you a specific case. That you may not know the name, you may not know this county because it's a very small county in Henan province. You may probably not know. But the truth is that as long as a coal mine is found Madam. in that county, every university and every college in that very small city op open the major of you know, exploring the mine coal. And every seems uh, attract so many university students to go to that major because the, those so oh, many you know in university graduates have no job because only one coal mine in our market. So that also happens. See, when we're talking about USA with so many lawyers, we will talk about oh, uh, oh, oh, so many you know students studying in finance or bank something like that. So what you're talking about is not actual true. And uh, spend so much time talking about your foreign. Policies. If you have problem with foreigners, stop them from entering and all inter improve the working condition within your country. What is more important is my partner has told you why brain drain. Why? It's because it reminds you where to, to improve and how to improve and keep your uh, talents within your country. And next is individuals' rights and the government's duty. My partner has already told you government's duty is choosing, you know, providing work, uh, surviving condition and also maximize your happiness. In the circumstances, if these individuals want to go, you actually violate their rights. And, uh, and my heart told you, uh, individual is not only an economic unit, it also has other needs, you know, culture, pleasure, entertainment, social conditions, and uh, r religious needs. And you just view, narrow down your view against an individual. Just to say you should make, con uh, make contributions to your society. And my heart does say, has told you the relationship between you know the state has duty towards citizens. Citizens are not necessarily has duty to work, to pay she. back to the state. At the very first beginning, you're not chosen to you, you don't have the right to choose to born in this country at the very first place. And so many people lose the capability to pay back to the society, but we still offer them minimum social welfare. It's because that you, the the right is surrendered to the government. We elect you, we surrender our right for you to make some policies to decide kind of what kind of life we should live. That is enough and that is already. So based on all those things, we're very happy to approach. Thank you. Right, we take a few minutes and all the speakers, please cross the house, shake hands, and give us time to communicate.